I'm actually really excited because what I want to talk about is hourly pricing program, I believe it's called. And this is specifically for electricity pricing. So it's for your electricity utility Most of the United States uses a fixed price per kilowatt hour of service. And so there's a national average, and I'll write this in blue, just to give a, we're gonna do a little dot here. Uh, the national average, and this fluctuates, uh, is actually around 14 cents per kilowatt hour if you used fixed price programs. Now, I lived in the Pacific Northwest for a short period of time in Washington, actually near Seattle. And this, and I know there's various exceptions to this, but this is the national average. There are areas in the United States where uh, I think in Seattle it's mostly hydroelectric. So they basically make almost more energy than they need. So they export a lot of it and the cost per kilowatt hour is way less than 14 cents. It's somewhere I think on the order of like four to five cents. But for most people, again, the average nationally is around 14 cents per kilowatt hour. And it's important to understand what that actually breaks down to. And I'm gonna bring out a heavily redacted ComEd bill. This is my ComEd bill. Do a pretty good job. They did a revamp of their bill, I think a couple years ago, which really helps clarify what you're paying for. So there's three pieces. The two big pieces are the supply, and this is the actual, they even have a little, little infographics here, which is really kind of helpful. The generation of the electricity and your charges for that. And then the delivery of that, that's as the infographic shows, that's the high tension wires, the transformers, switching gear and all that stuff that gets the power from where it's generated to your outlet. Well, to your house, not to the outlet inside your house, but to the meter. There are two charges here, plus there's some taxes and fees but we're gonna not really concern ourselves with the taxes and fees, but rather the supply and the delivery. This supply, generally speaking for most users in the United States, no matter who supplies their energy, is a fixed, is a fixed charge per kilowatt hour. But if you look at your bill, you'd probably see something up here that would show, uh, mine says residential hourly single, which means it's a non-static rate. I forget, I'll put it in the lower third what the what the term would be for if you're just on a standard rate. I think it's a standard rate or something like that. Then it indicates that you're paying the same amount for your energy no matter what time of day you're using it. And so for most people, if your energy usage is quite low, let's say you use less than three, roughly 300 to 400 kilowatt hours per month, if you're in an area where your national average is somewhere around 14 cents per kilowatt hour, that's fine. You're probably you're probably going to get the energy as cheaply as you possibly can get it. Because you have to factor in the supply plus delivery and a little bit of taxes and fees. But if your energy usage goes above that threshold of about 350 kilowatt hours. I actually have a spreadsheet that I did to, to kind of figure out what the break even point was using the hourly pricing program. And I can actually do another video actually where I walk through that. But basically the short of it is that around 350 kilowatt hours is the break even point for the ComEd hourly pricing program. And so what is it? What does this actually mean? And it's, it's pretty simple at its core. If you look at the fixed price program, you have three cost bins. So I'm gonna break them out here. You have supply, delivery, and taxes. 
the supply is roughly about on the national average eight to nine cents per kil uh, per kilowatt hour. The delivery is about five to six cents, and the taxes account for about one to maybe two cents on the on the high end, depending on your municipality, etc. So, the the hourly pricing program focuses on this bucket. They focus on the supply portion of the bucket. The delivery and the taxes, they pretty much stay the same. But the supply portion can be changed such that you're not using a fixed rate, no matter what time of day you're using the energy. And the reality is that when utility companies are generating energy, there's a market for that energy. Even though you, don't, you can't see it and it's not a tangible thing, there's a market for that energy. And so during the day at four o'clock on a hot summer afternoon, there's high demand and limited supply. So the cost goes up. But other times a day where maybe it's not 95 degrees outside and it's eight or nine o'clock at night, there's very little demand. So the cost of electricity plummets. And so what you end up with is a, a situation that looks more like this. And the, the technical term is called BESH, which I'll put in the what it means, but it's updated every five minutes. And this basically is the market rate pricing for electricity. So the hourly pricing program, as the name implies, doesn't focus on even though this updates every five minutes, you're not being billed for whatever the price is as it fluctuates every five minutes. You get billed based on what the pricing is per hour. If I were to draw a little graph here to compare the two. If we were looking at a typical day, uh, I'm going to put it on the x-axis here, dollars per, well, cost per kilowatt hour. This is not a super accurate graph, but just to give the visual indication of the differences between the two programs looking at 12 a.m 12 p.m and then 12 a.m the next day and let's say we're in april so gonna be summer we're approaching summer if you had the national average you're just using your regular utility your cost per kilowatt hour would just be a flat line across the entire day no matter what time of day you're using energy it's going to be basically 14 cents per kilowatt hour. But if you were using instead the BESH or hourly pricing program as ComEd um, sells it, so to speak, I'm gonna draw a couple tick marks in here so I can get a guide when the, the peak times generally are for, for summer and adding M's to this since I started doing it at one point is that the cost per kilowatt hour fluctuates. So you might see something along the lines of this. Make sure I actually can draw this without. So you might see a line that looks more like this throughout the day. And the peak here during the day might be even on pretty warm days, 85 to 90, 90 degrees outside, you might see, let me draw this all the way over to here, about eight to 10 cents, we'll just say 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So this is at the peak of everybody's coming home, turning on their air conditioning. It might peak a little bit earlier around four o'clock, but we'll say 6 p.m. everybody's coming home. It peaks at that time. So wow, that's that's, you know, that's pretty high, that's 10 cents per kilowatt hour, that's approaching this 14 cents. But you might notice that that's really only during that peak time of the day. So if you were to integrate, if you were to basically sum across this entire thing, the, the 14 cents per kilowatt hour for a given amount of usage, the same usage pattern, you would have just one rectangle of this is how much you're going to pay. Whereas the area under this is much smaller. And so for most of the day, 
12 a.m. to say, let's say 12 p.m., if you have your refrigerator turning on, cooking or whatever earlier in the morning, this might be closer to, let me draw right here, around 2.5 to 4 cents per kilowatt hour. Much lower than this and way lower than the national average. So you can start to see that if you look at this program, the hourly pricing program, if you do a little bit of shifting of when you're using various high demand appliances like your air conditioner. Let me do a draw line here. High demand, basically meaning high power. So your AC, dryer, washing machines, if you don't have gas appliances, you have electric appliances instead, then that can include many things, including your range, oven, it can be your microwave. I guess it doesn't matter whether or not you're uh, gas or electric, it's a microwave. Well, the dryer, definitely if it's electric. So definitely if it's electric. If it's gas, there's still a motor running. I was in one apartment uh, that actually had an electric hot water heater. So most hot water heaters are gas, but hot water heater if it's electric. I have an induction cooktop. So an induction cooktop, dishwasher. And you may have other specific unique loads like maybe you have a computer that you use that's a maybe a gaming machine that draws 400 to 600 watts or, or more. So there's a lot of unique loads you can plug in that if you're using them during peak times of the day, it might cost more during that narrow sliver of day but if you look outside of that, the rest of the day, you could be operating those appliances and getting your, your energy supply at a much, much lower rate. In fact, there are periods of time at night where early in the morning, or even at some points later at night, that the energy cost goes negative. You might see it for a period of time at negative 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Or, or lower, meaning the, the utility company is actually paying you to use the excess energy. Now, this might be a phenomenon that really only occurs in Illinois or in areas where you have high nuclear demand. We are, I believe, and I don't know this for sure, so do not quote me on this, but I'm just going to, in Illinois, I know that nuclear is pretty big here. And we also have natural gas. I know we're, we're getting more and more solar and wind, but that's a small percentage. I don't know what that totals. And I think we might have one or two coal plants. I That I don't know for sure, but I know nuclear and natural gas is somewhere around 70%. I think nuclear is actually almost 50 to 60%. Uh, again, if you know more about, I'm not an expert in our energy supply and where all the energy is coming from, but if you know know about this stuff, please feel free to comment in a friendly way <laughs> in the comments. Um, but the 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 key is that there is a lot of nuclear. The production of nuclear energy gets ramped up. It's good for producing constant energy, but it's not great at handling surges of energy, and that's for natural gas and other types of energy can be ramped up quickly to handle transients on the grid, everybody turning on their air conditioning at the same time. Nuclear really doesn't do that very well. So when they ramp things up, especially in the summer, it seems after using this program for about 10 years that they ramp up energy production probably for the day or whatever. And maybe it gets cool at night and there's not as many air conditioners running or a storm passes through and things are much cooler than they anticipated. They just can't turn down the nuclear. It takes a very long time. And so you, could, you can see costs just plummet down to negative, uh, negative pricing. What does this all mean? Well, for me, with a little bit of modification of how I use my energy, that is using the website periodically to check, there's a website I'll show that you can see the current pricing 
for the past hour, five minute updates, and then trends for the, for the next day, you can get a kind of a quick idea of what does it look like right now. You can also get, not you can also get notifications from ComEd when you sign up where it'll text you if there's going to be, they see that the cost of energy is trending high so that you may take action to reduce your energy usage and thereby decrease your bill. So Comet has a lot of things that help make best use of this. And it's completely optional. It's completely free. The only thing is you have to be in the program for one year. You can't opt in, get everything set up and then be like, I don't want this. And then you have to get out. They may have changed that, but I think it still is. Last I checked, there are companies out there starting about, I think 10 years ago when they broke up the ability for companies like ComEd uh, could break up the delivery and supply. And I forget exactly how that worked, but it allowed third party suppliers to come in and offer you energy at a lower price. And so some municipalities and cities have had agreements with these, com with these third party companies to supply energy at a much lower rate than the standard rate. And those could be somewhere on the order of maybe five to six cents per kilowatt hour which is decent, that's pretty good. Even if you take a look at that and compare it to what the average pricing is on the hourly pricing program, on average, I've found that the price basically is somewhere around 2.6 to about four cents a kilowatt hour. So it's still well below this. You might have periods where it does jump up and there have been a couple times where when it's gotten really, really warm, there's been a period of time where that costs went up really, really high. And it was like 30 cents or 50 cents or 80 cents. But it usually, actually I shouldn't say usually, it pretty much is only for that one hour. So you go, oh, I'm losing so much money because I'm paying so much for that electricity in that period of time. But if you can make simple modifications to the behavior of how you're using certain things, you can minimize that impact and then an hour or two later, the cost may come way back down again and you're back to just using things as you usually do. So what does it mean for savings? Well, in the five years that I live in Chicago, I ended up saving according to, and I'll put it up on the, put it up on here so you can see it in black and white, but uh, I saved about $500 over the course of five years. So about $100 a year so that, that was pretty impressive. And on average, the savings that I'm seeing is on the whole bill is between 28%, if I could draw and write, that'd be awesome, and 35%. Now that may not apply to everyone. We, in the, our current situation, our current living situation, we have an electric dryer, make heavy use of an electric induction cooktop, and we have a gas fired furnace and a gas hot water heater. If you're all electric for all of your appliances, you could save even more money than this. If you're all gas for a lot of your appliances, then that savings may be a little bit less. Again, it comes down to how much you're using, what sort of demand you have for energy, and then what your total amount of usage on averages over the course of the year. This program has saved quite a bit of money and with some behavior modification, just looking at the cost periodically, setting up the notifications, doing things like that, has helped basically get to this amount of savings. But I wanted to take it a step further. I wanted to get to a point where looking up things on the website, having notifications sent, all these things are, are great but I wanted it to be something that was more automatic. And that wasn't really something that I had to go and check or have to look at something and understand, okay, this is a number. What does this number mean? So I kind of wanted to automate some of the behavior modifications. And the biggest thing, the biggest power draw, I think, I think the national average said it's somewhere about 40% of your electric bill. It can even be more. Is, drum roll, air conditioning it accounts for 40% or more of your electric bill. What I noticed as well is that that was the one piece that is the most difficult to manage 
because you can't just go around running around your house you know if you're out or whatever you can set up a, a programmable thermostat you can get uh, various types of Wi-Fi connected things that you can change and do whatever to but it's kind of clunky and some of the products that are out there that sort of can interface with something like hourly pricing I never heard of some of these companies and the companies that I have heard of like Nest and Ecobee that do claim I think that they work with the, the API or, or you can program them to work with the API they've been acquired by companies like Google and Amazon I won't comment on that specifically, but I was sort of turned off by using those things and, and always had an interest and a curiosity of making something myself. So when I found out a couple of years ago that ComEd came up with an hourly pricing API, I don't know why I'm putting an arrow, but it was an API, an application programming interface to work with their hourly pricing program. And so it lets you do things like look at the past hour cost. You can look at five minute updates and look at trends. The, the forecast, they do a forecast kind of like a weather forecast to predict the pricing. Can I spell? Predict pricing for the next day. So this is what the hourly pricing API does. The idea that I had was to take this plus a whole bunch of other stuff and roll my own hourly pricing device we'll call it the hourly I can't write words hourly pricing thing would give some sort of visual indication of where the pricing is make it easier to look at something that would represent what the cost of electricity was instead of going like well what does 2.9 mean what does 4.5 mean what am I doing that stuff just cut through that and make it simpler and more relatable. The other thing was interface with HVAC system. This thing's going to work just like a thermostat. Well, it'll be a thermostat, but it'll take preferences from the user, from you, and say, well, I want it to not run if the cost gets too high, or modulate or marshal the way that it's running. Or an idea that the Department of Energy and the EPA recommend, which is pre-cooling, which is if energy costs are really low and it's cool outside, you can pre-cool your home and we'll say pre-cool with thermostat. You can pre-cool your home when, the, when it's cooler outside. Not only would you be paying less for the energy, but the air conditioner runs more efficient when it's cooler outside. If you can get a few more degrees or just like a degree or two lower, when it gets to be peak of the day, you may not need to run your air conditioning at all during that period of time. And you wouldn't notice anything different. The idea is visual indication of pricing, interface with the HVAC system, pre-cool home, and make it easy and accessible. Now, will it be easy and accessible to begin with? No, because it is a proof of concept slash prototype. This is the thing that I am embarking on. And so in the next video, I'll be showing you the start of this proof of concept and what it looks like and the things that I'm looking to build into it and how I see it becoming the vision that I had for making this program work even better for those who are wanting to save money. And if you can come up with a device that you can plug in, set some configuration where you have the control over what you'd like to have happen without effort, you can translate this into savings in an area where most of your electricity goes throughout the entire year. This is 40% of the electric bill through the entire year, but there's so much energy being used during this period that the pie chart of all your energy throughout the year, 40% of it is just AC. It's crazy. So if you can make use of this, you can reduce this without doing really anything else, save money, and with this visual indication of pricing, it'll help with marshalling the use of other appliances that you might not even think use that much energy, but actually do. And if you could look and go, oh, cost is a little high right now. Okay, I'll put, I'll set the timer on my dishwasher to start in two hours. Or so hopefully one. that was a useful and helpful introduction <laughs> into what the hourly pricing program is from ComEd.
versus the national average or even some of these third-party programs. I am confident that these, this must be available in other states. They may call it something different. It's something to check out to see if it's available in your area. In the next video, we'll talk about this project that I'm embarking on. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please, if you did, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. But in the next video, we're gonna take a look at the proof of concept. Okay, I'll see you in the next one.